plants exposed to glyphosate have much lower levels of minerals. It's also the case that glyphosate is an endocrine disruptor. The United States uses more per person than any other country in the world. I think America can solve her problems if they buy certified organic, their health will improve. You're listening to The Brendan Murata Show. In this episode, I talked to Stephanie Seneff, author of Toxic Legacy, How the Weed Killer Glyphosate is Destroying Our Health and the Environment. We talk about how the common weed killer glyphosate might be causing long-term serious health problems for Americans. We also talk about autism and get into a little bit of a debate about that because we have different perspectives. And we give some practical information that you can use to improve your health while exploring the larger picture of America's addictive behavior towards glyphosate. Now, here is Stephanie. The obvious question that I'd like to start with is just what is glyphosate and why is it a big deal? Uh, Glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup, which people are mostly familiar with the term Roundup. Um, it's a, you can go down to the garden store and get some Roundup and use it to kill the dandelions in your yard or to kill the weeds growing in your walkway. Very convenient. It kills all plants except those that have been engineered to resist it. And it claims to be practically harmless to humans, to humans, and that's why it's considered to be a wonderful herbicide. And it's used uh, extensively in agriculture. The United States uses more per person than any other country. And, um, and that's partly because it's supposed to be so safe to humans. So if we assume it's safe, we, we treat it carelessly. When we buy it, we don't realize we should keep our kids away from it. We could have them playing in the yard while we're applying it to the dandelions and not, realize that, not realizing the harm that it could be causing. And, of course, it's in the food because it's heavily used in agriculture. Uh, one of the things that happened in the 1990s was that they figured out how to uh, engineer plants to resist glyphosate. They put in a, a, a bi- microbial gene. They inserted it into the plant using GMO technology um, to give them resistance to glyphosate, which was a great boon for agriculture because then you could just spray it all over the crop and not worry about it killing the crop. made it a lot easier to control weeds and made it used a lot more after that. So they, and, and then the other thing that happened was as they were using it on these GMO crops, and these crops include corn, soy, canola, sugar beets, um, cotton, and alfalfa. Those are the main ones that are uh, Roundup Ready crops, they're called. And so they use it routinely on those crops several times a year to control the weeds, and it, it you know can increase the yield and that sort of thing. Um, but what was happening over time, in, over the first 10 years of this century, is that the... Uh, the weeds became more and more resistant to the glyphosate, so they had to use higher levels, more of it, you know, more toxic amounts of glyphosate, increasing the amount of glyphosate being used on the crops. And so we saw exponential growth in the use of glyphosate on crops over that over those 10 years. And that was in parallel with exponential growth in a long list of debilitating um, human diseases uh, and conditions, you know, and so we saw a big rise in obesity and diabetes and and Alzheimer's disease and autism, ADHD, various cancers like pancreatic cancer and thyroid cancer. Uh, We have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which has been uh, shown to be linked to glyphosate in studies of farmers, and we have many, many people now who are a part of a a class action lawsuit. We had three uh, individual lawsuits, each of which was awarded large amounts of money by a jury trial where they claimed that uh, Roundup caused their non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So um, we don't realize this is a a toxic chemical. We see that it's going up exactly in step with all these diseases, and people say, well, correlation doesn't mean causation, and how could one chemical cause so many diseases? Those are kind of the two comebacks that you hear when you point out to people how striking it is that all these diseases are going up in our society. And there is a question of why, and if you say it's not glyphosate, you didn't have to tell people what is it instead, because there is something that's causing us all to get very sick. There's a piece in there that I hadn't heard before that I found really interesting, which was that you said that the amount of glyphosate that agriculture companies, chemical companies have had to use has gone up over time. Because that reminds me a lot of what's happened with antibiotics is people Absolutely. have overused them and then if the thing that they're using them on has built up resistance. So it sounds like yes. the same things happen with glyphosate where the amount that might have been sprayed in you know, the, the 60s and 70s is nowhere near the amount today. Is that, is that an accurate understanding? Absolutely the case. In fact, it was pretty low right up until they invented the GMO crops. And once that happened, then they started really increasing the use of glyphosate because it used to kill the wheat plant as well as the weed, so it made it much harder to use. They do use it, by the way, also, and that's been an increasing trend. They use it on 
non-GMO crops. They use it right before harvest and as a desiccant. It dries out the crop. It, it forces the crop to go to seed so you can increase the yield because you get sometimes a whole huge field where part of it is ready to go and the rest of it's still behind. So you want to get them all to go to seed at the same time so you can harvest all at once and get increase your yield. And that's ter- glyphosate has turned out to be very effective for doing that because the, the stress forces the plant to go to seed as its, as its last gasp. And when they do that, they end up with much higher concentrations actually in the food. So we're finding the highest levels of glyphosate are in non-GMO foods. A lot of people don't realize that. So they'll buy non-GMO and think that they're safe, but actually they could be uh, making the situation even worse. And this includes uh, chickpeas, garbanzo beans, uh, lentils, oats, um, wheat, which is a big one because we have this epidemic in celiac disease that I think is a direct consequence of glyphosate usage on the wheat crop, Um, barley, um, and uh, sugar cane is sprayed right before harvest, and also some of the seed crops that produce oils, seed oils. Are organic foods sprayed with glyphosate, or is that part of what makes them organic, is that they're not? Disallowed, thank goodness, and that's been the big trick for me. I've been very careful when we shop at the grocery store, we always look for the certified organic label. Luckily, the number of um, the grocery stores are expanding their um, availability of certified organic foods. I, I've really found that over the past. I've noticed that over the past ten years that there's a more and more availability of certified organic, even in sort of the regular grocery stores. So you don't necessarily have to go to a specialty, high-end grocery store to get that certified organic label, which is great. You can get most things now certified organic. If you can't find it locally, you can, in desperation, find it on the web. So many of them you can just. Someone is selling it somewhere, and you might have to ship it from Wisconsin or something, but you can get uh, everything, uh, pretty much everything you need, uh, I find, uh, certified organic. And that's a very, very important label to look for. doesn't mean it's completely free of glyphosate, because glyphosate's in the, in the rain, it's in the water, it's, um, it's in the air. I mean, so it's, it's really pervasive in the environment. So they can't put a fence around their crop and say glyphosate can't come in. So it's found in certified organic foods, but generally at much lower levels. Yeah, I want to get back to that environmental thing later. But first, uh, just how bad is glyphosate? Because I think a lot of people, when they hear um, that term or or pesticides or they think about that, they're like, well, I mean, it can't be that bad. You know, like I feel fine. The the food I pick up at the grocery store looks like normal food. It should be okay. Mm -hmm. But you also mentioned a couple court cases where – the plaintiff had said that glyphosate was responsible for a health condition. So I, I want to understand when we say that glyphosate is a problem or causes health issues, what exactly does that mean? Like what can we show as being a cause or caused by increased levels of glyphosate in the food that people consume? Yeah, I think that's part of the problem, actually, because glyphosate's a slow kill. It disrupts things slowly, and then eventually you get some really horrible disease, but it takes a lot of time. And people get different diseases depending upon all the other conditions of their environment, of their gut microbiome. All these things are factors that play into exactly which disease do you get, and it takes time. So when you're young, you feel pretty good. You don't realize that you're being poisoned. And it accumulates in your body, too. So after you get above a certain threshold, things start to fall apart. Um, it really um, starts with the gut, and, uh, and that's one thing that's become very clear lately. There's now lots and lots of papers coming out. When you look maybe 20 years ago, there were practically no research papers on the gut microbiome. It was working. We didn't know it was what it was doing. We didn't care. It was working fine. That's, we don't need to worry about it. Gradually, as we saw more and more people getting distressed with respect to their gut, you know, and they were getting diarrhea and, and pain, you know, bloating, all these different issues that were showing up, um, then we started to think, oh, maybe there's something going on there, and we started studying the gut microbiome. And there, and these papers are amazing. Some of them are your eyes glaze over trying to read it because it's got so much data. You know, they do all this analysis of all the different, and it's very complex, and every person's gut is unique, so it's really difficult to to find the signal and all that noise. But there have been some clear trends that have been showing up that are showing that. Um, Uh, certain microbes are becoming uh, deficient in the gut and there's an imbalance where you're getting uh, pathogens growing too much. You may be getting candida infection in the gut that's causing symptoms of, um, you know, mold symptoms, um, uh, the uh, yeast, toxic yeast, candida, and uh, various uh, clostridia species that are producing toxic metabolites that can get into the brain and that's associated with autism. So you have... um, 
various uh, disruptions of the gut and, and poor peristalsis so that you get constipated and then you get a buildup of the microbes start to accumulate in your midgut and you get uh, SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So there's all these different issues that are going on with the gut and many, many papers coming out about them and associating them with just different diseases too. They found certain kind of gut profiles that are associated with rheumatoid arthritis and other ones that are linked to autism, you know, so they're fine. Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease in particular, is associated with certain patterns in the gut. So they're seeing, and they're realizing that the gut microbiome plays a huge role in keeping us healthy. And there also are papers that show that glyphosate preferentially kills these beneficial microbes. The, the bifidobacteria and the lactobacillus are very sensitive to glyphosate, whereas Clostridia and Salmonella are more robust. So you end up with this imbalance because glyphosate is acting like an antibiotic, actually. It's been patented as an antimicrobial agent. And it's also causing antibody, antibiotic resistance, which is interesting because you know we have an epidemic and an antibiotic resistance where you get these nasty infections and the antibiotics don't work anymore. People can die from those. This is happening in the hospitals. And um, there's a, there are papers that show that glyphosate, chronic exposure to low doses of glyphosate can cause certain microbes to become generically resistant to other antibiotics uh, because of their knowledge, the knowledge that they learn by perfecting their resistance to glyphosate, which is quite interesting, but also disturbing. So, so if I understand the summary of that, it's that it primarily disrupts gut bacteria. Is that an accurate understanding? It does disrupt gut bacteria, and that is where the problems start, but that's not the only thing it does. It, it, it binds to minerals. It binds to them and makes them unavailable, and it, de it deprives the microbes of those minerals to start with. So, for example, lactobacillus critically depend on manganese to be healthy, and glyphosate critically binds manganese, making it unavailable. It, it chelates it and hangs onto it and won't let it go. So the, uh, the manganese deficiency can be part of the reason why the lactobacillus are sensitive to glyphosate. But it also has, it has the effect of really disrupting the whole system. The body has sophisticated mechanisms of, uh, of carrying, actually, minerals and transporting them to where they need to go and delivering them to the enzymes that need them as a catalyst. That whole system is in place with all these different uh, proteins that play a role in it. And those get disrupted by glyphosate, too. So there's a, um, it, I think what happens is some of these minerals like iron and manganese become both toxic and deficient at the same time. So you can't kind of get the right amount anymore because too much is toxic, too little is deficient. But there's a really fine line uh, because your system of managing it is so, is so defective because of what glyphosate is doing. Now, in the list of things that you mentioned, one of them was autism. And since you brought that up, yeah, I'm autistic. I don't see that as necessarily being a problem. So when you say that it's linked to autism, what exactly do you mean by that? Right. I mean, autism has a continuum. And, and certainly I know very bright people who are, have this Asperger's syndrome, which is kind of high end autism. And I think they're very bright and they're also able to focus and, and, um, and do deep study, you know, and really get beyond other people in certain domains of science or whatever. So I, I admire those people. I think that's wonderful. And anything that, you know, causes um, changes in your behavior, some of it can be good. I mean, it can have a good side to it. There can be some other things that are sacrificed, but you get a, a benefit as well. And I think that's true of all biology. There's all different ways to be, be. And some people are very social and others are very studious, you know, and, and that's fine. We have all these different kinds of people. But when it goes too far is when it really produces a person who is not capable of taking care of themselves. And we certainly know that there are many of these autistic... The, the low-end autism is very severe. They can't talk. Often they're in chronic pain. You know, they're banging their head against the wall. They require constant, pair, the pain, uh, constant care, and their parents are really worried about what's going to happen when the parents are gone, who's going to take care of them. That, that extreme autism is not a healthy way to be, in my opinion. And we need to avoid that. We don't want it to go that far. So, so if I understand correctly, the the consumption of glyphosate and things like that is linked with symptoms of inability to function, chronic pain, inability to talk or express yourself. And it sounds to me like part of the challenge there is that the term autism is used to describe both that and hyper-focus, awareness to detail, all of those things. So it, it right. sounds like there's almost a... Another subject I've been reading about, epistemic justice issue, and that there, there is not the right word to describe uh -huh. the set of symptoms. Or the word that's being used is so broad that right. it includes categories that the person using it is not intending to describe. 
So if, yeah, so if there I was a word that fair. was like, yeah, so if there was a word for... Asperger's you know, is pretty good, I think. Asperger's is pretty good as a word that means sort of, and often is associated with being very bright, I feel. Yeah, but part of the difficulty with the diagnosis of autism is that it's entirely symptoms, and right. and it's often self-reported system. So I remember when I was first researching it, one of the questions that they had on the diagnosis was like not having many friends. It's like, well, you know, I was living in a city where I knew a lot of people and then I moved. Did I become more autistic when I moved to a new city and didn't know as many people? Like that doesn't make any sense, but they're uh -huh, sort of like, right. oh, well, that's a symptom, you know, it, so part of the other difficulty is that the diagnosis of it is often self-reported and the whole, you know, yeah. but it sounds like what you're describing is that people who have a high concentration of toxic chemicals like glyphosate also have chronic health conditions, which yes. some people use the term autism for, even though that term applies to multiple different things. Right. I think that's fair. And I think there is a genetic component to autism, and there may just be a genetic component to personality, right? And so some people, even but way before glyphosate, we certainly had people who were much more focused and didn't really care to spend a lot of time socializing. I mean, I was certainly like that. I, I don't... I get a lot of satisfaction out of, you know, reading a, a good paper in biology, and, and a lot of people think that's weird, but, you know, so it's, it, there's different personality types that are just, you know, programmed into your genetics, but but when it's toxic chemicals and they're causing pain and they're causing gut problems, these autistic kids, many of them have diarrhea, constipation, uh, bloating, discomfort in the gut. I mean, those are all indicators of some kind of damage going on in the gut microbiome that's then leading to some kinds of poisons getting into the brain and causing damage to the brain. And, and you can't argue that, you know, getting damage to the brain is a good idea. So, so when we talk about that damage, what are, is there a way of measuring that change in the gut microbiome? Is it just symptoms or is there a specific, like that we can see there's a change in the biology? There's a lot of changes that you can measure. As I said, there's an overwhelming number of details about those changes, but there are certain trends, and, and I talked about some of them in my book. I have a chapter, by the way, in my book, Toxic Legacy, we should mention I have that, a copy right? here. <laughs> yes. So uh, this was a, 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 a result of a very large effort. It was over 10 years uh, of studying and then finally two years of writing. So it was a very um, big commitment on my part to write this book. And I tried to write it at a level that would be accessible to a non-experts. I, I know I didn't completely succeed with that because the biology is difficult, and I apologize for that. But I don't. I didn't know another way around it, and I didn't want to leave that out. So, uh, when you're writing about balance. something controversial, you need the amount of citations that you do. So I actually appreciated mm -hmm. that as someone writing a book. Now, I, when I saw the fact that like a third of it was citations, I was like, oh, good. There's research here. So I, I appreciated yeah. that. Great, that's great to know because I have a reviewer who complained that too much of the book was taken up with citations. So you, you can't please everybody, but I thought that was important. I really wanted it to be well documented, especially as you say, because it's controversial. And I'm making a claim that's quite different from what the perception is that this chemical is very toxic and people think it's not. It's very hard, I think, for people to wrap their head around the idea that this is toxic because they've become so comfortable with using it in their yard, you know, and they haven't maybe seen effects yet or they're not aware that the health problems that they're suffering from are due to their exposure. So there's a lot of, um, it's hard to connect those dots. When it happens slowly, that's part of the problem is that it slowly erodes your health. It's a slow kill. And um, so that you don't, uh, you don't connect the, your symptoms to the, to the exposure that you've had. And of course, through the food, it's very subtle because we can't taste it, which is really unfortunate. If it had some nasty taste, we could pick up on it and know that we're eating it, it would be very helpful. And maybe we need to evolve to acquire that skill so we can learn how to avoid it, be able to taste food that has a lot of glyphosate in it. It's also the case that glyphosate is an endocrine disruptor, and that's something that they've only come to realize recently. Endocrine disruptors are interesting. There are many chemicals out there, as you probably know, like the plastics that are endocrine disruptors, and they have a stronger effect at very low doses than they do at higher doses, which is a curious uh, feature of endocrine disruptors. Low doses are very toxic. They end up tapping into the endocrine system and disrupting it and causing all kinds of um, problems, You know, particularly, for example, reproductive issues. And we have an epidemic right now today in infertility. So many couples are not able to have a child. They're going through fertility clinics and doing 
in vitro fertilization and spending lots and lots of money getting frustrated with you know failures over and over I feel their pain I mean I really feel sad that people are having such a hard time producing offspring and um and I think that glyphosate is one of the one of the players in that whole space uh, of disrupting fertility, and uh, sperm you know sperm counts are going down, and male sperm counts, and uh, sperm motility is going down, and and then of course uh, you can have a risk of having a child with some kind of genetic defect, which can be a consequence of toxic exposures in utero. So these things are all very concerning, and glyphosate's not the only one. Of course, we really are so bombarded with toxic chemicals today and we seem to be very comfortable with rolling out new ones all the time with grossly inadequate testing and and uh, the you know the regulatory agents are agencies are failing us in a big way i feel they're so uh, persuaded by the industry that these chemicals have to be kept in place and they're so it's so hard to get them to hear the message from the from the population that they feel they're being poisoned by them. It's just so difficult to get the regulators to respond. I was going to ask about that because one of the things that I've heard is that people who have gluten, wheat, soy allergies, when they go to Europe, where there's larger regulations on this, they don't experience the same problems and they can eat bread and pasta and things like that from Europe without any health problems. And and I've heard a lot of people say that when they visit overseas, their health dramatically improves. They have more energy and, and for a whole series of environmental regulations, perhaps. But I was wondering, is glyphosate legal in other countries? Is the regulation different, or is it primarily an American thing, or is it worldwide? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, And it is different for different countries. Some countries have have banned it entirely. Uh, Sri Lanka was a leader back in, I think, 2015, 2016. They banned glyphosate usage, and that was because they were seeing that the agricultural workers were dying from kidney failure. And I've actually, I've actually published together with collaborators a couple of three papers now, I think, on that issue of glyphosate causing kidney failure among agricultural workers. That's happening also in, in Central America. And El Salvador banned glyphosate for the same reason, because they were seeing you know young men 40, in their 40s dying from kidney failure uh, after uh, uh, working in agricultural fields where glyphosate was used, in particular in, in um, El Salvador, it was the uh, spraying the sugar cane with glyphosate. They would spray it right before harvest to dry it out. And to sh- ripen it, it actually produces more sugar. Again, just like the going to seed, it causes the sugar cane to produce more sugar, increasing the yield. And then they would harvest the cane a few days later, so they were really getting up close and personal to high levels of glyphosate during the harvest. And, um, and, and when it was causing serious problems with the kidneys. Um, and then, interestingly, Mexico has decided they're going to phase out glyphosate. I don't know if you've heard this. By, 20, I think, 2024, they're going to completely eliminate it, which is extremely exciting news to me because I think that's our next-door neighbor and yeah. <laughs> really kind of too close for comfort. And, and um, the United States is very upset with them for doing this, which really infuriates me with respect to my own country. Um, the United States is putting pressure on Mexico to back down. You know, we're threatening them with trade uh, issues and whatnot. We can put, um, we can apply pressure, that you know, financial pressure that could cause them to fold. And so far, they have not. So I'm very, very proud of Mexico for standing up to the United States and going ahead and insisting they're going to uh, completely phase out glyphosate by 2024. The United States uses more per person than any other country in the world. We've been very happy. We're in early and deep. You know, we were among the first, very first to use it. And we were so pleased with the way it could allow us to make agriculture a lot cheaper. You know, and we lost all the small farms in the process. The farming started getting consolidated into these huge farms with a very low maintenance, very few people involved in farming because it's so easy to control the weeds. It really reduces the amount of human effort that you need to grow food. But, of course, it greatly increases the amount of human effort you need to take care of all the sick people. I don't think you win with this situation, and this is the thing that we need to realize, is that you can save your money, buy cheap food, poison yourself, and end up with extremely high medical costs as a consequence, and it will not be a win. On top of that, you'll be feeling terrible. So it's you know it's not um, worthwhile, I think, to buy that food. People need to be convinced that if they buy certified organic, their health will improve. They'll feel better every day which is such a win, and they won't have to spend all that money on medical treatments. So it's um, we need to get the population to be aware of that. 
I think America can solve her problems bottom up. And this is where I have hope is for the individual consumer to refuse to buy the toxic food. And uh, especially as we become more aware of exactly which foods, such as the garbanzo beans, so refuse to buy hummus unless it's organic. They can't make non-organic hummus if we won't buy it. We just need to understand that it's going to be toxic. And the consumer, so it's consumer education followed by consumer action. That to me is the, uh, the way to go. I got to say, I'm skeptical of the idea of consumers being the place where change needs to happen. Because one of the things that I notice when I go to the grocery store, as someone who cares about my health, who wants to find healthy foods, is that there's a lot of really deceptive labeling practices around what constitutes healthy food. So you'll see things like a, a carton of yogurt that's listed as gluten-free. And it's like, of course it's gluten-free. It's yogurt. Like, mm -hmm. what, what is this labeling? So uh, what, I'll, what I notice is that there's a, lot, a, a conscious effort almost from companies to hide this information from people who are buying. And I, I don't, that's something I wanted to ask you about is why is it that the, the agriculture and chemical companies that are involved in this, do they like, I just am really curious if you think is like, is it malice or is it ignorance? Because at this point, it, it seems pretty clear that a lot of the things that they do are harmful to human health. And they are continuing to do them. So there's that, I just come back to that question of like, well, are they doing it on purpose or are they doing it because they don't care? Like, what is the motive to continue using these things? Is it just profit? Why is it you think that they are continuing to use this? To use glyphosate or to use? To use, to use glyphosate, to use all the, I mean, there's a whole host yeah. of chemicals you could ask this well, question certainly, about. Well, certainly, I mean, the whole way food is, is, you know, dealt with in this country is way off kilter right now, I think. It's not just the use of glyphosate and other chemicals, you know, the herbicides, the insecticides, the fungicides, all these toxic chemicals that we use on our food. The concept of eating something that's been sprayed with poison feels really wrong to me, and I don't understand why others don't see that picture so clearly as I do. Um, the industry, the food industry, as you know, is really big on processed foods, and they have these soy protein bars. You know, they're very synthetic. They're not really foods anymore. If you look at the ingredients in a soy protein bar or a soy formula, one of these soy drinks, it's just ridiculous. Most of the ingredients look like chemicals. You know, it's not a food anymore. They basically take the foods apart into individual um, chemicals and then mix them together to make pseudo foods is really how I would describe the processed food industry. And these things are by no means something healthy. So I think the other thing besides just eating organic is also eating whole foods. And I really encourage people to think in terms of eating something you recognize, you know, a head of cauliflower or a piece of meat, you know, it's sort of these things are very obviously coming from animals and plants, natural nutrition. As soon as you start trying to eat a soy protein bar, it's just got all kinds of stuff in there that you don't recognize, and it can't possibly, in my opinion, it can't possibly be a healthy choice. And of course, they're also heavily contaminated with glyphosate because the soy is a GMO Roundup ready. A lot of the soy is GMO Roundup ready. So I think um, the food industry is, is certainly partly to blame for our poor health because they are, um, they're, they're interested in making money, of course, and they can make these products and sell them and make a good profit. And they have a lot of power, a lot of influence over what we buy. And they also use a lot of you know, synthetic uh, flavorings as well to make things taste really good. So actually often when you have cookies, you know, and you have like an Oreo cookie, which tastes really good, they've got these great synthetic flavors, versus a, you know, a, an organic version of something that looks like an Oreo cookie where they can't use these synthetic flavors. The Oreo cookie tastes better, and it's loaded with glyphosate. You can't taste the glyphosate. So the kids might even say, well, I don't like that other cookie. It doesn't taste good because it doesn't have all these synthetic flavorings. So we really are able to use these non-natural you know, chemicals to put into our foods to fool our palate into thinking that this is a very delicious food, whereas, in fact, it's not good for us. So the food industry has really gotten derailed, I think. What you're describing almost sounds like a drug dealing element. Where you, no, that's true. Yes. If you, if you eat something <laughs> natural, point. you'll feel good long term. But if you shoot some drugs in, man, you're going to feel really good for a really short amount of time. Not good long term, really good bad point. long term but for a moment. Oh, man. And it sounds like it's the same way with uh, synthetic foods. Like if you bite into an Oreo, a Snickers bar, uh, 
you know, whatever, tastes good. Just right. not really right. good and for your health. That's a good point. And monosodium glutamate is a good example because that's very heavily used in the processed food industry, monosodium glutamate. It's, it comes in all kinds of disguises. And, um, and I think it's, it, it's actually a neurotoxin. Pure glutamate is a neurotoxin. Uh, yet it, it really tastes good. So it fools you into thinking you've got something wonderful here. Uh, and it's deceptive. Um, it's deceiving your taste buds, really. So do, are the people who are involved in these companies, do you think they're aware of the negative impact of their, their product? Or is this something where they're, they're in denial about it? Because I, I know, for example, uh, when smoking was being investigated as a potential cause of cancer, the, the tobacco companies were aware and made a conscious effort to suppress the science. So is there something similar here, or are they just... Is the word just not out about it yet? I think this definitely has to be something similar with respect to Monsanto and, and, and glyphosate because uh, my friend Anthony Samsel, he and I collaborated on a number of peer-reviewed uh, publications. He's an interesting guy. He's a, he's a toxicologist and he has his own lab, lab in his home. And he's been um, testing lots of things for glyphosate and finding it in lots of interesting places. But he's also... Um, he was able to get a lot of information from Monsanto through the Freedom of Information Act. He requested a FOIA request. He got uh, huge amounts of stuff from Monsanto's early research back in the 1970s and 1980s before they got approval. Back when they got the approval of the product, um, they did these studies, and he, he has read these studies, and he has seen that they saw that there was evidence of harm, which they hid. You know, And so they, they did some sleazy stuff with respect to um, getting past the regulatory process without revealing their hand, you know. And so one of the things, for example, was to show the glyphosate accumulated in the tissues. And they exposed and a very interesting experiment that we've written about in one of our papers where they exposed bluegill sunfish, these are fish, to radio-labeled glyphosate so they could track the radio label to see where the glyphosate went. And then they looked at the tissues of the fish and they found the glyphosate label, the radio label in the tissues. And then they measured glyphosate levels in those same samples and came up short. They only had like 20% of the radio label that they could account for as glyphosate. So it started out as glyphosate, and then they couldn't figure out what happened to it. Then they got the brilliant idea of adding uh, uh, enzymes that break down proteins into individual amino acids. And when they did that, they increased the yield to 70%. So 70% of the label was then able to be identified as glyphosate after they broke down the proteins. And the important point in that is that the uh, our, my big story in my book is that glyphosate gets into proteins by mistake in place of the coding amino acid glycine. This is what I think is happening that makes it insidiously, cumulatively toxic in a really weird way that is uh, hard to notice at first but builds up over time because it goes into the tissues, gets into the proteins, messes them up. And they said in that paper, in that article, it wasn't a published publication, it was just a private study that was done for Monsanto that Anthony had a hold of, and they said perhaps it was incorporated into the protein. That's their words, and that's exactly what I'm, I've been saying in my book. It's getting, uh, it's substituting for glycine by mistake, and it is a glycine molecule. It just has extra material stuck to its nitrogen atom, and that's what makes it so bad is because it's an amino acid. Uh, amino acids that are not natural amino acids are very dangerous because they can do this sort of thing of messing up the proteins. And that's a critical, I mean, it's a critical part of glyphosate's toxicity that I think the Monsanto people knew way back when, but refused it, to admit. And do you mean the proteins in the human body or in, in the environment? In the human body, in the plants, okay. everywhere, in the microbes, everywhere. So does that include soil? And you know, I've, one of the things I've read about is soil depletion, the idea that using certain chemicals over time causes the soil to be, um, to produce crops that are less nutritious and less good or... So it's absolutely, part of that as well. absolutely. Soil gets really getting messed up by glyphosate. That's why the uh, the crops initially, when they first started using glyphosate, they increased the yield by quite a bit. But every year it got worse and worse and worse. And eventually, you get to a point where you 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 don't you keep on doing it because you've been doing it every year. But you get to a point where you're not actually improving your yield anymore because you're ruining you know that, the soil and the, the crop, and also the health of the crop and its value as a nutritional source is is lower because it's it's lost a lot of its minerals. And that's one thing Don Huber showed in studies. He showed that plants exposed to glyphosate have much lower levels of manganese and, 
and iron and zinc and, and, and uh, these different critical uh, minerals and sulfur. And sulfur is an important one that I talk about in my book. Yeah, I saw there's a whole there's a whole chapter on sulfur and just how that's helpful. And I know someone who uh, was working with an herbalist and was told to supplement that. So why why is sulfur important? Sulfur is very important, and it's an overlooked nutrient uh, that we don't make a big deal out of. In fact, it doesn't have a minimum daily requirement, which is interesting. Uh, it's, it's you know it, there's a lot of it in the body, and in particular, uh, sulfur in the form of sulfate. Sulfate is a one sulfur atom, four oxygen atoms, and minus two charge. It's a it's a it's an amazing molecule, and sulfate is uh, is very very important to our uh, circulation for one thing, and also for our brain. Heparin sulfate is uh, is in the uh, it, well, it's everywhere in the body, but in the ventricles in the brain, which is where the cerebral spinal fluid is, heparin sulfate there is very very important for the maturation of the neurons during early life. And uh, many studies have shown that autistic uh, rats, I mean, autistic mice, as well as autistic humans, have uh, insufficient heparin sulfate in the um, cerebral spinal fluid. Sorry, and, I got to so, ask how do you how do you find out a mouse is autistic? Uh, they have autistic symptoms. They've actually there's quite a few studies. It's quite cool. They've even created a mouse that breeds true for autism which is quite amazing, a genetic mouse that breeds true for autism that they study. And they have certain ways that they can test their behaviors and they have a certain model for what characterizes autistic behavior in the, in the mice. It's, it's quite amazing, I, we're, I'm both gonna, in terms of socialization. I, this is off the, off the glyphosate topic, but i got to ask, what are the symptoms of autistic mice? Well, it's again the antisocial issue. Like if you put, they put them into these situations where there are other mice nearby, and then they t test how often they go to check out the other mouse, like whether they want to in engage that kind of thing. Um, and they can show cognitive problems as well. You know, like not being able to follow the maze as efficiently, not learn as easily uh, the maze to get out of it, and those kinds of things. They have various tests that they that they do with these animals, and then they they can measure. They actually videotape them, and then they. They measure how often they do this and that, and they can, can they come have scores that will identify what they call autistic behavior. So it's okay. It's a, so antisocial, not as good at the maze. Is there anything else? Yeah, Cogn cognitive problems, memory problems, antisocial problems, those kinds of things. The the next time someone says, "Oh, you don't look autistic," I'm gonna. I'm going to try to see if they have an image of what an autistic mouse looks like because that's, that's a new <laughs> one. Yeah. So jumping back on the glyphosate topic, one, one of the things that you mentioned is that over time it works less. And so I'm curious... Uh, you know, are these companies that are using it aware of that? And what's their strategy? Are they going to continue using it? Are they going to go off? Because it sounds like, it's again, I mean, it's the behavior of a drug addict. Again, like the first time you take a hit, it yes. feels really good. And the next time, still good, not as good. And so it sounds like that they're, they're hitting the uh, point of diminishing returns with it. So I'm curious what the plan Hi. is now. I'm really glad you brought that out because I think that's true. And in fact, I've been seeing what's been happening lately. As I said, every year they have to use more because the weeds are stronger. And then lately, it's actually started to fail against certain very robust weeds. So they're introducing new products that have glyphosate plus. They add another herbicide to the mix. And then they also modify the genes so they have an additional GMO. So they have crops that are resistant to both glyphosate and dicamba, for example. And this is something they rolled out in the last few years in the Midwest, in those agriculture areas where they've been using glyphosate heavily for many years, they're having really big failures in the ability of glyphosate to control these really nasty weeds. So they have these new products, and dicamba plus glyphosate mixed together, uh, the dicamba covers the weeds that the glyphosate can't fix. And so that's been a huge problem because the dicamba has been um, getting uh, spreading to the neighbor's farm and killing the neighbor's crop because the neighbor has a crop that is not resistant to dicamba. So it's getting killed by the dicamba, and then you've got these lawsuits going on. So there's a lot of lawsuits among farmers. They're fighting over the dicamba situation because they're being forced to buy <laughs> to buy a dicamba resistant crop, just not even even if they're not going to use the dicamba because of their defensively they have to buy it. 
And uh, so they're quite angry about that, and there's a lot of frustration. And there's another one that's glufosinate plus uh, glyphosate or glyphosate plus 2,4-D. They're doing these kind of mixtures, which is really dangerous because every time you mix two chemicals together, it's often the case that they are synergistically toxic, which means that Mm. the one is more toxic in the presence of the other one than it would have been without the other one's help. So there's a lot of that going on as well. So we're going to have, I think, even more and probably new kinds of uh, health conditions that are going to show up with the dicamba and the 2,4-D, those are going up now. We're getting greater exposure to those other very toxic herbicides, and we know they're toxic. You know, the, We think of glyphosate as being much less toxic than all those other ones, and we're so pleased because we can use glyphosate for the most part and control the weeds. But the fact is glyphosate is not much less toxic than all those other ones, but they're also equally toxic as glyphosate. So you've got a real problem going on with this increased exposure to toxic chemicals over time that is causing this huge health care crisis. And you know our country is not able to get ahead of the health care costs. We're going to be bankrupted by the health care costs in this country. We just don't know how to fix the problem. So many people are, are have aches and pains and you know, just all kinds of health conditions that they can't seem to fix and getting all kinds of doctor bills and whatnot. We won't go bankrupt. We'll just print more money. Just take that. <laughs> I know there is that. <laughs> just take that addict behavior we're using on the food and we can just apply it to the money and it'll all be fine. Um, uh, that's true. I've been fascinated by that. We just can just keep on making money, literally making it. And that's how we can solve well, our financial problems. I, I mean, you, the solution that you describe also sounds like addict behavior. It's, you know, like, well, this drug is not getting the same effects, so we need to try something harder, right? Like, mm-hmm, it's the mm-hmm. same sort of process. Uh, and one of the things that I, I, you know, that makes me angry about this and that I worry about with it is that there's a lot of ways you can opt out of this. So, like, you can eat organic food. You can do things for your own health. But some of the environmental effects of it that you discuss in your book really bothered me. So for example, Mm -hmm. things like glyphosate going into the ethanol that's burned in fuel and then Mm -hmm. just released into the atmosphere. And and it bothers me because I don't know how to opt out of the atmosphere. Like that's not one where I can just like get a different air condition. I mean, I guess you could move out to the far distant country, but at some point it's like, can you just not spray that in the air, please? We would appreciate that. Um, so how, how, what are the environmental impacts of it? And then is there a way to combat it? Or is there going to have to be a point where if we want our health, that we make some sort of change to that environmental aspect? Yeah, I think that's a serious problem. And that's one that I find very frustrating because I can go ahead and eat certified organic food, but I can't control the air. You know, If I'm driving the car... Uh, on a highway, and then there's all these toxic fumes in the air. I can't not breathe, you know. You basically have to. So to, and to have to avoid going places, never going to the city, I mean, that's pretty pretty huge price to pay and doesn't seem at all reasonable. So, and, you know, we, uh, I think we're not uh, nearly adequately aware of the danger of glyphosate getting into the air, and I actually think that's been a factor in COVID-19. And I've seen that, you know, New York City got hit so hard by COVID-19 way back in April last year when it first all started. And New York City is a leader in the biofuel industry. And they um, they have they drive a lot of trucks and cars that are um, using biofuels that I suspect are contaminated with glyphosate. So if you think of, like, growing the, the wheat crop and spraying it with glyphosate, harvesting the crop, and then taking the, the, rub, the rubble that's left behind throwing it on a barge, taking it down to the city, running it through a, a, a chemical plant that turns out biofuel out of that wheat crop. That biofuel is almost certainly going to have a glyphosate in it. And, uh, you know, combustion would break it down because the temperature of combustion would definitely break down glyphosate, but it can evaporate before it reaches combustion, I think, and you end up in the air. And then you're breathing it, so you're getting glyphosate in the lungs. And I have a whole chapter in my book on glyphosate disrupting the immune system. And I explain exactly how I think that's happening in the book. And so your immune system in your lung is being hit hard by glyphosate. And now you pick up the virus and you can't fight it off. So you get a tremendous inflammatory response in the lungs that can kill you. And um, there was a study recently in Brazil, and this is after I wrote my book, so it's not in my book, but there was a new study out of Brazil where they looked at 
nanoparticles in the air. They were looking for glyphosate and they found it. And they found it in the areas, where, in the agricultural areas where they were spraying it. But they also found it in the city and they found higher levels in the city than they did in the agricultural areas, which was a surprise. And I think it's because Brazil is a leader in bioethanol. and They have designed trucks that can run almost on pure bioethanol. And those trucks driving through the city are releasing glyphosate into the air, I suspect. Bioethanol is derived, in their case, from sugarcane, which is sprayed with glyphosate right before the harvest. It also sounds like another case of that mislabeling or confusing labeling that the chemical industry does. Because I know ethanol is often touted as like the cleaner, you know, mm -hmm. safer. Oh, no. Which is totally not true, by the way. They've done the studies and they've seen very clearly that the bio fuels are much more toxic. Uh, they've done the studies with the animals to show that they're much more toxic than the natural fuels. They know they're not safe. They don't know why. And they don't, they don't realize, I mean, it's not just glyphosate, of course, there's other things in there that are toxic, but um, I don't think they're, they're a healthy choice at all. And we're moving forward very rapidly, actually. We've made a lot of uh, efforts lately. You can see there's some buzz going on about, like the uh, aviation biofuel. I'm concerned about the health of the air in the airplanes because of aviation biofuel. The airplanes are, uh, the airplane companies are being encouraged to think in terms of biofuel because they have such a uh, costly effect on carbon footprint. We're all about you know, trying to reduce the carbon dioxide in the air and they have to sort of do something to compensate for and what they're doing is putting biofuels into the airplanes which is very, very dangerous, I think. Yeah, I've used the analogy of an attic before in this conversation and one of the things that addiction is often used for is to avoid something to avoid a feeling that you don't want to feel or a, a realization or something that someone needs to confront so if we were to use that analogy what is it that that the people involved in this and that maybe we need to confront or notice or feel that all of this is being used to avoid what's the realization that people involved in food production and health and chemical companies need to have? I wish I knew. I mean, I'm sort of really surprised that they are willing to go to these great lengths to cause so much trouble. I don't understand how they sleep at night. You know, these people who are denying that their product is, is, is unsafe and, um, and then being very vicious in their attacks towards people who say otherwise. It's really quite remarkable where the state we're in right now there's a very, very powerful um, industry at the top that is, uh, has a lot of money and a lot of control, and they're controlling them, everybody. And they're certainly controlling the uh, regulators and the governors, the governments, and um, preventing us from really getting to where we need to be. And uh, you know, we, we really need to be um, very proactive. I feel, uh, I think it's almost too late. I mean, I think the United States, I think, is going to go down first because we're um, the most poisoned. And uh, maybe we'll be a lesson for the rest of the countries and they'll behave themselves. <laughs> but uh, I have a very grim uh, view of the future of this country. And it's very sad for me to say that because I do think it was once a great country and we've just gotten way off track with where we need to be. And if we could just get um, you know, behind the messaging of, of reducing, eliminating toxic chemicals everywhere, really think in terms of natural, all the time think in terms of natural products everywhere, you know, and to, um, and to think in terms of healthy food and really emphasize wholesome, whole foods, healthy food. It's so diametrically opposed to where we are now with this incredible control of the processed food industry producing these toxic foods that, um, that they um, promote and they promote them very strongly through advertising to try to convince us that they're okay, you know. So we're in a very frustrating place right now where there's a lot of disinformation in the mainstream media that um, is very hard for people to get around that to realize what the truth is. We just need to have a tremendous effort to uh, get, and young people should think in terms of buying a piece of land and, and turning out an organic farm. I mean, I have this lovely image of all these small organic farms coming back because they're practically gone now. We just have these mega farms that are so toxic and um, we need to go back to the small family farm. So I would encourage anybody young to think in terms of that as a career path because it's going to be really the most essential thing that's going to take us into a healthy future. I know a lot of people who would like to do that 
myself included. So mm, I wonderful. hear you there. That's wonderful. You mentioned, though, um, you use the phrase the U.S. going down or like having a, a big failure in some way because of this issue. And I want to ask, what would that look like or what would that mean? Because, the you know, if you're if I'm using this analogy of addiction, addicts will either have a realization and clean themselves up or they'll hit rock bottom. And it sounds like you're describing them that the hit, the hitting rock bottom scenario is a bit more likely. So what does that look like? I kind of, yeah, I kind of think that's what's going to happen. I feel, I find it uh, amazing that um, more people aren't aware, I guess is the thing. To me, it seems so clear where we're headed and it's really not good news. And, uh, and it's going to be, uh, I mean, everyone's going to be so sick and so poor because they have to spend all this money on health care. And the country it won't be able to, you know, provide adequate health care for all the needs. And all these people who are debilitated, too, like all the uh, Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is going up dramatically. Parkinson's disease, you know. These are really debilitating diseases that are very costly in terms of money, but also in terms of the amount of care that these people take. That's taking people away from other things that they could be doing that would be in some sense more productive for society. So I think we're just going to end up where everybody who's capable and still not very sick is spends all their time taking care of the ones who are sick and we won't have time to do anything else and we'll be very um, strapped for funds because it's so expensive to take care of all these sick people. So uh, we, we won't be able to focus on anything great at that point. We'll just be trying to survive. And I think it's coming sooner rather than later. I feel like there's tremendous increase in the number. I just notice it around at the airport. You see all these people that can barely walk. They've got a cane or they're in, in a wheelchair. You have all the wheel, wheelchairs lined up when the flight arrives. It's just very sad to see, you know. So it's it's debilitating widespread health failure. Which, exactly. You know, it does feel a little bit like we're already there for a lot of people. I, it's a... Mm-hmm. Uh, I know a lot of people who are incredibly healthy and the people I know who are really healthy are interested in topics like this. And the people I know who just kind of go with what they're told about food and eat the USDA food period pyramid, seven helpings of grain a day are not looking (laughs) as good. (laughs) Right. That's a good point. Yeah, it's funny that the nutritional experts are advising us very poorly. Even aside from the glyphosate, I feel their advice is very poor, and it's really more targeted towards what makes money for the food industry rather than what's healthy for us. Well, is there anything that you want to say that we or talk about that we haven't talked about? Anything that you want to make sure to that we didn't cover that you'd like to? Anything that you wished I had asked that I hadn't that I didn't that you want to <laughs> nice get in before to we finish? It. You did well. Thank you. Um, I think we covered a lot of topics, and I just hope that the people listening will heed the, heed the call. I mean, I think people can be active. I think it would be good for people who are concerned about this to be proactive, because I think you can feel better about the situation if you think you're actually trying to fix it. And if everyone who tries to fix it is going to really help our cause. And either, as you said, by even just growing a garden at your own home for your own needs, you know, grow some tomatoes, um, in your backyard. I mean, there's ways you can become s- more self-sufficient with your food and make sure, of course, that it's certified or, or that it's organic. Don't use any chemicals on it. Um, and, of course, even ha- starting a small farm, I think young people starting out, the more people who can do that, it, the better off we're going to be because we need to get rid of those mega farms. And then spreading the word to your friends, to your family, to eat certified organic, and buying certified organic, or, you know, local... Uh, Farmers who you trust, I think that's for, even if they don't have a certified organic label, because sometimes that's expensive to get. If you trust them and they're use, they're growing their foods without chemicals, uh, buying local is really great. And eating whole foods rather than uh, processed foods. Getting out in the sunlight uh, without sunscreen and without sunglasses. That's one thing we did not bring up, and I really believe in sunlight as a uh, source of health. And we're not getting enough sunlight exposure, so that's an important one to get, not just for vitamin D, but for other things as well, as I talk about in my book. So Toxic Legacy is the name of my book. Um, I hope you might consider reading it because it will definitely help you to, uh, to understand why I think this chemical needs to be banned worldwide. And I would love to see the United States take a leadership role. I don't expect it. I expect us to be the very last to cave and the sickest country in the in the world at that point. So it's very sad. As you know, our life expectancy is going down dramatically right now. 
I hadn't heard so that. So on that actually. happy note. <laughs> yeah. I actually hadn't heard that it's going down. That's unfortunate to hear. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for chatting with me. And uh, again, like you mentioned, Toxic Legacy, if you want to learn more. Oh, wait, one last thing. Uh, do you have any website, social media that we should make sure oh, yeah. to include in the show notes? Uh, okay, yes. Yeah. StephanieSenef.net is my webpage. Um, and my book is there under StephanieSenef.net slash book. You can find all links to various booksellers. So the best place to buy it right now is uh, at the at Chelsea Green Publishers, which is the publisher. They have a discount, good value discount um, price for the book right now. They're having a sale. So you can save some money and spend it on that high premium organic food exactly <laughs> well thank you for right. talking with me this has been my been pleasurable and uh, good luck to you thank you thank you for listening to the brendan Murata show if you liked this episode please share it with someone else who would also like it and then go on whatever platform you listen to the show on and leave a positive review if you want to support the show directly, go to brendanmurata.com slash show and subscribe there. Paid subscribers get special unreleased bonus material and live events that are only available to them. Once again, that is brendanmurata.com slash show. Thank you for listening, and I will talk to you all later.